Hello. You have learned many things, and I just want to talk about some of those things once again. Here we have seven principles from the Man-Q textbook, and they are, number one, people face trade-offs. Number two, the true cost of something is what you give up to get it, the opportunity cost. Rational people think at the margin. People respond to incentives. Trade can make everyone better off, and markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. And finally, number seven, sometimes the government can help or improve on the market outcome. Now, the reason we have number one is because of scarcity. We don't have everything, we don't have unlimited resources, and therefore we have to make choices. When we make those choices, one hard thing is that we have to figure out the true cost of our choice, and that's the opportunity cost. When we make a final decision, we have to think at the margin. We would compare marginal benefit to marginal cost. We have an incentive when the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. And then we will see that trade can make everyone better off, and in a perfect world, Markets are usually a good way to organize activity, but sometimes the world is not perfect. We have an imperfect world, and then we need the government to perhaps step in. Now, let's start with number four first. People respond to incentives. I think this is the, the most important principle. So what we're saying here is that people have an incentive to do an activity if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. We can see that this here is related to marginal thinking and that the true cost is the opportunity cost. The marginal cost of something is the opportunity cost of doing that. And also, of course, when we make these choices, there are things that we're not going to be able to do, so we face a trade-off. Now, people will keep on doing this activity until the marginal benefit is actually equal to the marginal cost. Now, we know that people will always stop doing whatever they're doing because as they do more and more and more, we see that the marginal benefit will be decreasing, whereas the marginal cost is increasing. That is, the benefit of the activity goes down. For example, the benefit of eating pizzas goes down as we eat more and more slices of pizza. And at the same time, the cost of that activity, like eating pizza, increases as we eat more and more slices of pizza. Now, we have to remember, though, and this is an important point that we have highlighted, which is that incentives come in several flavors. So we have uh, economic incentives. These are the self-interest. These are the ones we usually think about. But we also have moral incentives. This is feelings of guilt. Like if we don't do something, we feel bad about it. And we have social incentives. This is the peer pressure that people put on us. Even if it's not in our self-interest, sometimes we do things because our peers expect us to do it. Now, there's a strong connection to both principle number six and principle number seven here. So usually when an individual makes his or her choice, she will do that in the self-interest, maybe because of moral and social interest as well, in order to make herself as well off as possible. So for the individual, this will be efficient. So, and of course, if we let all individuals do their own thing and everybody acts in their own self-interest, and we live in a perfect world, then we're talking about markets organizing our activities. And it is as good as we could possibly get it to be. Now, of course, we know that sometimes the individual's interest is not perfectly aligned with society's interest. So sometimes, you know, you and I will do something, but it's not in the interest of society. And this is when we need a government to step in. Sometimes we think of it in terms of regulatory framework. We have to have a legal system, otherwise we'll just do crazy things, perhaps. I would. Or we can think of it in terms of taxation. 
in order to increase or change our marginal cost or maybe the marginal benefit of our activities, the government can get us to do what it wants us to do. All right, so what we want to do next is take this to the entire economy. All right, so when we think about the entire economy, then we have this notion that uh, principles 4, 3, 2, and 1 affect each individual's decision-making and the choices they make. But of course, if we were to add up everybody's choices, we will have the entire economy's choice. So uh, usually we try to figure out, you know, how, how are all these people related to each other? How are they interconnected to each other? And sometimes we draw this circular flow diagram to kind of describe that. We simplify things, of course. So we have firms, households, and a government and we have market for goods and services up here, and we have market for inputs down there. And what we have here then is that households will be paid by either the firm or the government, so this will be the, their income. And then the household will spend most of that income on goods produced by the firms. Some of that income will be spent in the form of taxes to the government, and the government will use those taxes to either buy stuff or, I mean, to buy stuff or to hire input. And of course, the firm, as they get paid for selling their goods, some of that money is going to go to the government. And again, some of that money is going to go to the households in form of uh, salaries and wages and these kinds of things, price for capital. All right, so this is really good. But this just shows how, you know, how the economy is interrelated to each other. But what can the economy actually do? In order to figure out what the economy can actually do, we have a production possibilities frontier, like right up here. This PPF is really showing principles, you know, 3, 2, and 1 for the entire economy. First of all, this uh, shape of the PPF, or where it's located, shows that we cannot have everything. You know, we can't get to a point out here because we have scarcity. Our resources is, are scarce and we only have so much uh, technology. At the same time, we can see that if we want to have more of good X, we're going to have to give up something of good Y. And then again, that shows scarcity and the trade-offs that we make. How many units of good Y we give up in order to get good X? Well, that's the, the trade-off. Uh, quantify. This is then what we call the opportunity cost. And if you think about 1x, usually we think of uh, the opportunity cost becoming the marginal cost of something. All right, so uh, this shows what we can do. If we added taste and preferences, we knew what, government, I mean, what the consumers and households really wanted to consume in terms of good x and good y. That will tell us that we're going to be at some point on the PPF, right there perhaps. So... And of course, at that point right there, we will have a certain level of opportunity cost, which will be equal to the, the slope at that point. And that's going to be very important when we get down to a demand and supply framework. All right, so first of all, uh, if I draw my PPF like this, you can see that the slope is changing as we produce more and more and more X. In fact, the slope is getting steeper and steeper which means that the marginal cost and the opportunity cost are getting higher and higher as we choose more and more X. That is what our supply curve shows us. Now, if I were to think about a demand, so I would put taste and preferences into this diagram, we would have a demand curve that shows the willingness to pay, which is determined by each person's marginal benefit or all the people together and, and how much they value these goods. That demand curve would then determine how many units of X will be consumed and produced in this economy. And that should be equal to this amount up on the PPF. This is going to be the same amount here. And the opportunity cost there is going to tell us what the relative price is. So this will be, you know, the equilibrium price, which is an opportunity cost as well. All right, so here we have, we can see that, you know, everything that we know in terms of the, the principles, it's true for an individual, but if we add all the individuals together, 
we can see how they interact with each other, and we can see what the choices are that all of them together as, a, as an economy can make. And that is, again, related to our demand and supply framework that we have talked about before. All right, so again, we see this uh, demand and supply framework here that we derive from the PPF. And you can also notice that this demand and supply framework here is related to our uh, circular flow diagram because the market of goods and services are all made up of demand and supply diagrams just like this. All right, but what if we actually want more? You remember I said that because of scarcity, we cannot get to this point outside of our PPF. But is there some way to get there? Well, yeah. The PPF is determined by resources and technology. So if you have more resources or better technology, we could, we might be able to ship our PPF out in something like this fashion and reach this point that we, we have there outside of the PPF. So sometime in the future, we might be able to get to that today unattainable point. But turns out that even if we are extremely impatient, we could actually get to this point by doing something else. And that something else is trade with other people or other nations, depending on the scale of, of our discussion. So, for example, here, in this case, if somebody were to, say, start specializing a little bit in terms of producing good Y, and then maybe they will start trading that good for good X according to some relative price, which is usually called terms of trade, they might be able to get to this point through trade, even if the number of resources stayed exactly the same, or the level of technology stayed exactly the same. So, uh, trade is a shortcut to getting to a point outside of a PPF. But how does trade trade work? Well, trade is, you know, there's a, there's a reason to trade if uh, countries or people are different from each other. So here we have two, say, countries. The production possibilities frontier for one country looks like this. The production possibilities frontier for the other country looks like that. And even if we assume that everybody living in these, in these countries are exactly the same, so there are some tastes and preferences that are very similar to each other, you can see that this uh, country over here, they will probably, you know, they will produce maybe over here, and therefore the opportunity cost is going to look something like this. And this one, having similar preferences, will probably end up consuming somewhere over there, and therefore their opportunity cost is going to be something like that. But we notice here that the opportunity cost here is lower than the opportunity cost over there. So, you know, if you have the same demand curve, same preferences, then these curves here will be very similar to each other. But because of the different PPFs, we would trade out, trace out two different kinds of supply curves for these two countries. In one country, the relative price is going to be low, maybe, say, 3. In the other country, the relative price is going to be much higher, say, 5. And because of those differences in relative prices, there is an opportunity for both countries to gain from trade. So if that were the case, if they decided to trade with each other, then they would have to figure out, you know, what price are we going to trade one good for the other? Well, if the terms of trade turns out to be in between the two opportunity costs, which it has to be if trade is voluntary, and then, you know, we might think that maybe it will be, you know, something like four or something right here, if the terms of trade turns out to be four in between the two countries, opportunity cost, we will have that this country over here will be producing more than they consume, and therefore they can export some of their production. And this country over here will be wanting to demand, they want to, the quantity demand is going to be greater than quantity supplied, and therefore they would want to import some of these goods. If they do, at this relative price, you know, this, going to be, this country is going to be an exporting, so they're going to specialize in producing some more X, and then they're going to trade, and they're going to be able to consume somewhere over here. These guys will be able to trade at a term of trade which is flatter than what they had, so they will be able to be outside of their PPF as well. So both countries can reach points outside of their PPF, and therefore they both will be better off. 
Now, the next thing we want to look at is, you know, it looks like they're going to be better off, but are they really better off? So let's look at efficiency and welfare analysis just for a second here.